Good morning, guys. All right, I'm just trying to get my camera in the right spot. Um, pretty good. Oh, just a little bit. Guys, I have like the silliest videoing setup. I put it between two water bottles to hold my phone up. <laughs> All right, here we go. We are in chapter 22, and a little recap of last time was that Stanley took the blame for taking the seeds, and then Zero dug his hole for him. So he's kind of getting accepted as one of the guys, it seems like. All right, so here we go, chapter 22. Stanley was the first one finished. He spat in his hole, then showered and changed into his cleaner set of clothes. It had been three days since the laundry was done, so even his clean set was dirty and smelly. Tomorrow, these would become his work clothes, and his other set would be washed. He could think of no reason why Zero would dig his hole for him. Zero didn't even get any sunflower seeds. I guess he likes to dig holes, Armpit Ed said. He's a mole, said Zigzag. I think he eats dirt. Moles don't eat dirt, X-Ray pointed out. Worms eat dirt. Hey, Zero, Squid asked. Are you a mole or a worm? Zero had said nothing. Stanley had never thanked him, but now he sat on his cot and waited for Zero to return from the shower room. Thanks, he said as Zero entered the room. These pages are really hard to turn. There we go. Thanks, he said as Zero entered to the tent flap. Zero glanced at him and then went over to the crates where he deposited his dirty clothes and towel. Why'd you help me? Stanley asked. Zero turned around. You didn't steal the sunflower seeds, he said. So, neither did you, said Stanley. Zero stared at him. His eyes seemed to expand, and it was almost as if Zero were looking right through him. You didn't steal the sneakers, he said. Stanley said nothing. He watched Zero walk out of the tent. If anybody had x-ray vision, it was Zero. Wait, he called, and then he turned after him. Zero had stopped just outside the tent, and Stanley almost ran into him. I I'll try to teach you to read if you want, Stanley offered. I don't know if I know how to teach, but I'm not that worried, worn out today, since you dug a lot of my hole. A big smile spread across Zero's face. They returned to the tent, where there was less likely to be bothered. Stanley got out his box of stationery and a pen out of his crate, and they sat on the ground. Do you know the alphabet? Stanley asked. For a second, he thought he saw a flash of defiance in Zero's eyes, but then it passed. I think I know some of it, Zero said. A, B, C, D. Keep going, said Stanley. E. Zero's eyes looked upward. F, said Stanley. G, said Zero. He blew some air out of the side of his mouth. H, I, K, P, H, I, J, K, L, Stanley said. That's right, said Zero. I've heard it before, I just don't have it memorized exactly. That's all right, said Stanley. Here, I'll say the whole thing, just to kind of refresh your memory, then you can try it. He recited the alphabet for Zero, and then Zero repeated it without a single mistake. Not bad for a kid who'd never seen Sesame Street. Well, I've heard it before somewhere, Zero said, trying to act like it was nothing, but his big smile gave him away. The next step was harder. Stanley had to figure out how to teach him to recognize each letter. He gave Zero a piece of paper, and he took a piece for himself. I guess we'll start with A. He printed a capital A, and then Zero copied it on his sheet of paper. The paper wasn't lined, which made it more difficult, but Zero's A wasn't bad, just a little big. Stanley told him he needed to write smaller, or else they'd run out of paper real quick. Zero printed it smaller. Actually, there are two ways to write each letter, Stanley said, and he realized this was going to be even harder than he thought. That's a capital A, but usually you'll see a small a. You only have capitals at the beginning of a word, and only if it's the start of a sentence or a proper noun, like a name. Zero nodded as if he understood, but Stanley knew he had made very little sense. He printed a lowercase a, and Zero copied it. So there are 52, said Zero. Stanley didn't know what he was talking about. Instead of 26 letters, there are really 52. Stanley looked at him, surprised. I guess that's right. How'd you figure that out? He asked. Zero said nothing. Did you add? Zero said nothing. Did you multiply? That's just how many there are, said Zero. Stanley raised and lowered one shoulder. He didn't even know how Zero knew there were 26 in the first place. Did he count them as he recited them? 
He had Zero write a few more upper and lowercase a's. Then they moved on to capital B. This was going to take a long time, he realized. You can teach me ten letters a day, suggested Vero. Zero. Five capitals and five smalls. After five days, I'll know them all. Except on the last day, you'll have to do twelve. Six capitals and six smalls. Again, Stanley stared at him, amazed he was able to figure that out. Zero must have thought he was staring, star, staring for a different reason because he said, I'll dig part of your hole every day. I can dig for about an hour, and then you can teach me for an hour. And since I'm a faster digger anyways, our holes will get done at about the same time. I don't want to have to wait for you. Okay, Stanley agreed. As Zero printing his bees, Stanley asked him how he figured out it would take five days. Did you multiply? Did you divide? That's just what it is, Zero said. It's good math, said Stanley. I'm not stupid, Zero says. I know everybody thinks I am. I just don't like answering their questions. Hmm. I think I know people like that. Later that day, as he lay on his cot, Stanley reconsidered the deal he had made with Zero. Getting a break every day would be a relief, but he knew X-Ray wouldn't like that. He wondered if there might be some way Zero would agree to dig part of X-Ray's hole as well. But then again, why should he? I'm the one teaching Zero. I need the break, so I'll have the energy to teach him. I'm the one who took the blame for the sunflower seeds. And I'm the one who Mr. Sir is mad at. He closed his eyes, and images from the warden's cabin floated inside her head. his head. His, her red fingernails, Mr. Sir writhing on the floor in her flowered makeup kit. He opened his eyes. He suddenly realized where he'd seen that gold tube before. He had seen it in his mother's bathroom, and he'd seen it again in the warden's cabinet. It was half of a lipstick container. K.B. Hmm. So that tube that he had found in the dirt that he turned in, he saw it in the warden's bathroom, and he saw it also in his mother's bathroom. Mm, and it had that, that KB with a heart around it. So think about that. But also think about Zero. Have you ever met someone like Zero, right? Can you think of a friend or a person you knew growing up or a parent even, right? Who maybe isn't book smart, right? Maybe they weren't good at school or, you know, math or reading or something like that. But they were just smart. Like they just knew how to do stuff. I find those people very fascinating. But yeah, so think about that. Oh, sorry, it kept going. I thought that was the end of the chapter. Page 100, KB. He felt, he felt a jolt of astonishment, like, aha. His mouth silently formed the name Kate Barlow, as he wondered if it really could have belonged to the Kissin' Kate, to the Kissin' Outlaw. Mmm, so the KB is for Kate Barlow. dun dun dun, dun. All right. So now we're going to go back in time a little bit, um, and we're going to learn about, yeah, we're going to learn about um, what happened at Green Lake in the past. So here we go, page 101, chapter 23. 110 years ago, Green Lake was the largest lake in Texas. It was full of clear, cool water, and it sparkled like giant emerald in the sun. It was especially beautiful in the spring, when the peach trees which lined the shore bloomed with pink and rose-colored bl blossoms. Excuse me. There was always a town picnic on the 4th of July. They'd play games, sing, dance, and swim in the lake to keep cool. And prizes were awarded for the best peach pie and peach jam. A special prize was given every year to Miss Catherine Barlow for her fabulous spiced peaches. No one else even tried to make spiced peaches because they knew none could be as good as hers, as delicious as hers. Every summer, Miss Catherine would pick bushels of peaches, like buckets and buckets of peaches, and preserve them in jars with cinnamon, cloves, nutmeg, and other spices which she kept secret. The jarred peaches would last all winter, and they probably would have lasted a lot longer than that, but they were always eaten by the end of the winter. It was said that Green Lake was a heaven on earth and that Miss Catherine's spiced peaches were food for the angels. Catherine Barlow was this town's only school teacher. She taught in a one-room schoolhouse and it was old even then. The roof leaked and the windows wouldn't open and the door hung crooked and its bent hinges. 
She was a wonderful teacher. Full of knowledge and full of life, the children loved her. She taught classes in the evening for adults, and many of the adults loved her as well. She was very pretty. Her classes were also often full of young men who were a lot more interested in the teacher than they were in getting an education. But all they ever got was an education. One such man was Trout Walker. His real name was Charles Walker, but everyone called him Trout because his two feet smelled like a couple of dead fish. This wasn't entirely Trout's fault. He had an incurable foot fungus. In fact, it was the same foot fungus that 110 years later would afflict the famous baseball player, the famous ball player, Clyde Livingston. But at least Clyde Livingston showered every day. I take a bath every Sunday morning, Trout would brag, whether I need it or not. Most everyone in the town of Green Lake expected Miss Catherine to marry Trout Walker. He was the son of the richest man in the county. His family owned most of the peach trees and all the land on the east side of the lake. Trout often showed up at night school, but never paid attention. He talked in class and was disrespectful of the students around him. He was loud and stupid. A lot of men in town were not educated. That didn't bother Miss Catherine. She knew they'd spent most of their lives working on farms and ranches and hadn't had much schooling. But that was why she was there, to teach them. But Trout didn't want to learn. He seemed to be proud of his stupidity. How'd you like to take a ride on my new boat this Saturday? He asked her one evening after class. No, thank you, said Miss Catherine. I got a brand new boat, he said. You don't even have to row it. Yes, I know, said Miss Catherine. Everyone in town had seen and heard the walker's new boat. It made a horrible loud noise and spewed ugly black smoke over the beautiful lake. Trout had always gotten everything he ever wanted. He found it hard to believe that Miss Catherine had turned him down. He pointed his finger at her and said, No one ever says no to Charles Walker. I believe I just did, said Catherine Barlow. Oh, this miss sounds fun. I like her. All right, so we'll stop here for today. Um, if you want to do your vocabulary and your summaries, okay? All right, I'll see you back for the next chapter. Bye.